dependent on others. And we will explore questions such as what does a strategic autonomy in medical products mean in Europe? And also what does it mean in Africa? Uh, and also what is the African public health perspective on this issue? And what uh, role can the EU and the Netherlands play uh, with regards to technology transfer and also the sharing and protection of intellectual uh, property rights and intellectual property um, so what is really the role of the Netherlands to increase local production at home and also elsewhere? Well, this is very relevant because in Europe and in Africa, the shortage of medical products raises questions about access to health and people's access to medical assistance they need. And in the midst of growing medicine shortages, uh, the only producer of, uh, for instance, generic medicines in the Netherlands was recently even at risk to disappear. So if we leave these in full to the market, uh, it can be uh, tricky and they were only saved at the last uh, minute. Uh, and last week, uh, it was also announced that the Dutch government uh, has placed on sale on the markets uh, a vaccine production company, Intrafac, where uh, this is a government owned vaccine company and now we are willing uh, to sell this. Uh, whereas in general, uh, the tendency is to be more wary about this strategic autonomy. Because uh, if we are dependent on a small group of producers, there is also this risk uh, that we cannot secure this uh, autonomy. And uh, in addition to Europe, also Africa is considered a region at risk as it struggles with the local production of medicines and also, of course, has a strongly growing uh, population. So for also towards the future, it's important to uh, consider this more uh, structurally. Um, well, uh, why, of course, this agenda is so much on our radar screen is also because of the COVID-19 pandemic. When we uh, saw eh, the critical dependencies, uh, we all still know the medical uh, protection gears, uh, shortages, and also the uh, vaccines uh, race and struggle. Uh, so we realized very much the necessity of securing and diversifying the supply of medical products. And in other fields, we also see this strategic autonomy agenda and Klingenau works very much on this in the field of defense, energy, uh, critical raw materials and, and other issues. Um, it's also featured prominently in the Dutch global health strategy that came out in the autumn of 2022, which explicitly underlines the need to expand local production worldwide and also strengthen uh, supply mechanisms in order to improve the health systems and contribute to pandemic preparedness. So to avoid that we end up in a COVID-19 situation that we experienced. And the topic is also very prominently included in the recent EU uh, health, global health uh, strategy and, and recent policies in the, at the EU level that came out. And it's also covered by the G20 that's currently chaired by India, uh, of course, a prominent producer of medicine. And later in 2023, in the autumn, uh, the WHO, the World Health Organization, will organize a forum on local production of medicines and other health technologies. And this will take place in the Netherlands. So, yeah, to, to say it shortly, and uh, one of the speakers, Ellen Hoon, already mentioned it in a, in a short pre-talk that we had. This is really the talk of today. How can we uh, address this issue of local medicine uh, uh, production? And I'm really happy that she is joining, uh, Ellen Het Hoen, uh, who is a, as a speaker, uh, Ellen Het Hoen, who is a fellow at uh, the University of Groningen, the Center for Health Law and also the Director of Medicines Law and Policy at Groningen University. Uh, and for many, she will also be known because she was really the driving force behind the patent pool in uh, Geneva. And I'm sure that she will also uh, refer to that. We are also very pleased that we have as a speaker uh, Tajuddin Raji. Taj, as uh, he's usually referred to, and we've agreed that we would uh, call him like this. He is the head of the Division of Public Health Institutes and Research at the African Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. And we're very pleased to have him and to uh, hear his perspective on this issue of um, local medicine uh, production. Uh, and then we're also very pleased that we have Matthew Downham joined us. 
Uh, he is the Director of Manufacturing and Supply Chain Networks at the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness and Innovation at CEPI. So he's, he is really one of these person that really understands, you know, how medical uh, supply chains and manufacturing uh, work and, and inform us about uh, this perspective. So with them, uh, we're going to discuss these issues. Um, but before that, I would like to say that this is the third in a series of online events that we have organized that explore the complexities around carrying out a multi-sector global health strategy and also our aim is really to contextualize global health debates that are going internationally or going on, on internationally and relate that back to what happens here in Europe and the Netherlands and what we could also do to contribute constructively to such global uh, challenges and debates. And our objective is also to engage with you because that's very much yeah, a possibility in uh, webinars such as these. So before we enter into the debate with the speakers, we want to pose you uh, two short questions in the poll function in Zoom. So unfortunately, it's only for the people who joined us uh, in Zoom that can participate in these poll questions. And I'm not sure if the speakers can participate, but let's see. And we would in any case be very much interested also to hear their perspective on the poll questions. So Inga, maybe you could be so kind to upload the first poll question, which is European governments should create more local production of medical products, although health costs may increase for citizens. And then I agree, I don't agree, and I don't know, I don't have an opinion. I know already that one of the speakers wanted to say, well, I don't agree entirely, but for a poll question, we decided to keep it black and white. Uh, we know, of course, in reality, it's probably not as black and white as it's stated here in this poll question. So let's see what kind of answer people have given to this poll question. Do we already have the results, Inge? Let's see. Ooh, most people say even if we have to pay more for our health insurance, we should have more local production in the country. But there is also a considerable group who do doesn't know or doesn't agree with this uh, statement. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, let's move on to the second question that we have prepared. Sharing access to patents and know-how on how to produce medicines, particularly with African countries, is necessary to enhance local production. And then an answer that you can give is, I agree. Intellectual property rights hinder local production. I don't agree. Patents can guarantee the new developments of medicines. Or I don't know, I don't have an opinion on these issues. So let's see what our audience thinks of this. Ooh, most people say intellectual property rights hinder local uh, production, uh, but there is also a significant group that says, I don't know, or I don't uh, uh, agree. And I guess this is also an issue where, you know, a more nuanced perspective might be taken, but it's quite interesting also to see that um, a lot of people in the audience consider intellectual property rights uh, really a um, uh, an hindrance, uh, uh, a difficult uh, factor. All right, um, I think this gave us quite some uh, uh, background information already on the topic, uh, and I would like to hand over the floor now, first of all, to Remco uh, for you to ask uh, some of the questions that we have Thank you. prepared. Louise, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, to discuss this uh, this matter also in a bit in a post pandemic time where we really need to think how to further uh, the debate on uh, on local production and access to medicines and also what we can learn from the from the COVID pandemic. Uh, Ellen, <clears throat> you're an expert on health law. How did you answer the poll questions? And what is your take on recent European Commission's proposal to revise the EU's pharma legislation that uh, that came out last uh, last week or two weeks ago, I think? This newly proposed legislation includes a boost to transparency. It's about more effective compulsory license provision, but but also provide exclusivity for antibiotic development. What's your take? Um, over to you. 
Okay. Well, thank thank you very much, and I'll, I'll I'll try to be brief because that's what you asked. Because these are really huge issues. Well, first yeah. of all, on the on the local production, as panelists, we couldn't vote, um, and I, I was happy about that because I would have would have liked to have voted. I agree, but that, so mm. l- luckily I have the right to speak here. So um, I, I think in, in, when we talk about Europe, but I think the same is true for the African Union. So I'm very, very keen to hear what Tasha has to say. Uh, we should, we should in a way stop talking about local production because people often understand that as each country for its own. Mm. While what you want is regional. Uh, increase regional production to be able to benefit from the uh, from the regional uh, re- regional markets and market opportunity. Now, with regard to the European Union, of course, the access to medicines problems in the EU are very different from the kinds of problems that that countries in the African Union uh, deal with. But I think the reason why so many people voted yes is probably because there is this sense of uh the need to feel more self-sufficient and less dependent we've seen that and of course that is very much fed by what has happened during the COVID-19 pandemic when uh when all of a sudden you know supplies of vaccines even vaccines that were produced in the EU actually uh went uh went elsewhere in certain uh, certain areas in the world were not were not served at all there were shortages of certain products uh, we've experienced that in the ne- Netherlands, for example, with, in, in, in the area of diagnostics that really required firm government intervention in order to, to that, that was actually partly mm-hmm. solved by the ability to, to produce uh, the product. This was the license buffer in, in, in one of the diagnostic machines, thanks to the Dutch sort of pharmacy uh, production, pharmacy um, uh, capacity. Uh, that is that is supported in this uh, in, in in this country. Um, so the um, so so that on on the on the on the local on local regional regional production, we should train ourselves. I mm. think to talk about regional production and more diverse uh, more diverse production. Um, it, and and of course uh, that may in certain situations lead to somewhat higher priced uh, products but i also think if you have sufficient production in various regions that will also help to keep the 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 api the active pharmaceutical ingredient production uh, alive and that 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 is essential also to keep uh, to keep the price within within bounds so um those are just a, a few remarks on on regional mm. regional production and self reliance. Now, then you ask me the um, the big question on the um, the EU uh, pharma uh, pharma legislation because you don't want me yet to go into the IP question, right? Because that's, no, no okay, that's what come. Let's I'll, go into the let's go the, into the farm in the, yeah, into the legislation to the EU pharma legislation. There is actually an interesting element <laughs> of a recognition of the need to tap the EU market potential with one of the proposals that caused quite a bit of stir by the European Commission to um, to establish an EU-wide mechanism for compulsory licensing of patents. So far, you can own compulsory licensing as the competency of, of national, national governments. So there's so you can issue a compulsory license, which means that you can you give others then the patent holder the right to make use of that patent. So if the patent holder, for example, doesn't produce, doesn't produce enough, or it only produce offers it at a too high price, a government can intervene and issue a compulsory license. But if you have to do that country by country, and you can then subsequently not export or, or ap- export only limited quantities within the European Union, that does not make a great deal of sense. And the Commission has recognized that and is proposing an EU-wide mechanism for compulsory licensing in crisis situations. Again, very much as a result of what has happened during, uh, during COVID, uh, COVID-19. So that is, that's part of, of a larger package because we've seen the pharmaceutical proposals for pharmaceutical legislative changes and, and proposals in changes in, in intellectual property um, management. Now, I think the most significant change in the pharmaceutical legislation is the more modulated approach to incentives 
through the regulatory system, the medicines regulatory system in the European Union, there is a variety of incentives uh, available. They're almost all based on granting market exclusivities or market monopolies through data exclusivity or market exclusivity or orphan drug exclusivity. And that, that until now or, or Today, that is very much a one-size-fits-all. If you bring a new drug to the market, you automatically get eight years data exclusivity. You get automatically two years market exclusivity. And in the new proposals, which is called modulated, those, those incentives are more linked to certain conditions, and in particular, the condition that a product is, um, is made available in all uh, EU EU member states. I think that that is an important development. Mm -hmm. So the overall data exclusivity is rolled back from eight to six years, but you can gain the two years back if you actually make the products available in the entire single market, which is of course what the single market was meant to do in the first place. So, but um, that that apparently uh, did not uh, did not did not happen. Um, so that is that is an, an, an that is an important uh, development in the area of orphan drugs. So drugs for rare diseases, um, it will a, a similar. You see a similar development, so similar proposals. Also, the automatic exclusive periods have been rolled back, and it will be more difficult, if not impossible, for companies that have done very little in terms of R&D investment to obtain or the 10 year orphan drug uh, exclusivity. So that has also been uh, been rolled back. Um, so so I, that is, I think, a, a, a useful uh, development to to link these incentives more to uh, to certain certain conditions that will help increase um, increase access. On the other hand, the Commission is also proposing an entirely new exclusive right, which did not exist before, and that is the transferable data exclusivity voucher. And that is, the, it's a proposal. I talk about it as if all of this is going to happen. That remains to be seen because these proposals need to be discussed by the European Parliament and subsequently by the Council. In the middle of that, there will be elections. So we have no idea how this package in the end will will. You know how what what it will look like, but uh, the the Commission's proposal for the moment is to um, to experiment for a period of fifteen years with this transferable data exclusivity voucher that is valid for one year to uh, a, a company that develops a new antimicrobial, but that voucher can be traded, so it can be applied to other products. If this is established, what will likely happen is that this voucher will be applied to a blockbuster product. And there are, there are a number of concerns. First of all, it seems to be a, a very costly uh, costly way of, of, of doing it. it um, and the cost will be shifted on the shoulders of an arbitrary group of, uh, group of patients. Um, and one may wonder whether it wouldn't be much wiser mm. to just finance this type of drug development uh, directly. Certainly since HERA has been established, that seems to me a, a, much, a much better way of, mm. of going. So just to conclude on this subject, um, there, is, uh, th th there are a lot of interesting new developments in these proposals, but the basic premise that granting exclusive rights and granting more exclusive rights, it is a good thing. And what we would have liked to have seen is um, also some more experimentation with newer ways of financing research and development and the introduction of a sufficiency principle where you, you, you at some point say, okay, you can get these exclusive rights, but you have to demonstrate that you still need them. We now see blockbuster products, for example, benefiting from orphan drug exclusivity, and that that really should not mm -hmm. should not be the, should not be the case. Um, yeah. There's a lot more to say about yeah. this, but I think I should stop yeah. here. No, but I think it's very. I'm very happy that you that you explained this also for the audience. It's a quite a complex uh, legislation, and it's good to have this overview. Um, let's move to the African Center for Disease Control. Tash, you're the head of the, the public health institutes there. What's your take on the relevance of regional production and autonomy 
in relation to the access to medicines policies and cooperation uh, in, in Africa. Uh, you, the, the African CDC have, have published a new African public health order ID and principles. How does that relate to developments since COVID-19 and what you're now hearing from the European side? No, thank you, thank you, um, Ramco. And uh, let me also thank um, Ellen for really setting the stage for a very robust uh, discussion as far as this um, in, um, topic of uh, discussion is a concern. Let me also, on behalf of Africa CDC, thank you for invitation to be part of this. And um, Ahmed really extend his, um, his uh, apologies for not being able to be part of this uh, uh, discussion. But having said that, as you did mention, Ramco, um, since 2017, Africa CDC uh, was established and uh, we have always called for a new public health order for a couple of um, reasons, you know? And of course, uh, when the COVID-19 struck, uh, it was clear that uh, Africa indeed need a new public health order. And uh, our head of state and government have added their voice um, to that. And uh, underpinning this new public health order are five critical pillars, which are very, very important when it comes to global health in general, but much more specifically when it comes to uh, medical supplies, medical countermeasures, which is the focus of our discussion here um, um, today. Number one uh, on that list is to strengthen our public health institutions. And I'm sure you are aware that uh, uh, in addition to Africa CDC, the African Union has also launched the African Medicine Agency, which we believe will shape the way we manage this um, terrain of medical countermeasures. Number two is workforce development. Of course, all this discussion around um, tech transfer, around manufacturing will be meaningless without a fit for purpose workforce. So workforce is critical. Number three there, which really is the centerpiece of our discussion this afternoon, is the need for local manufacturing capacity for those, those uh, medical supply that I would describe as air security commodities. That's vaccines, diagnostics, therapeutics. Without local manufacturing capacity, the so-called strategic autonomy is not achievable for any of our member states. Because I mean, when you look at strategic autonomy, uh, a simple translation of that is a security sovereignty of each and every member state. So with that ability to manufacture locally, you cannot do that. Today, as a continent of 1.3 billion people, we only manufacture 1% of our vaccine needs. Now, how do you guarantee air security that way? It's not possible. We saw what happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, where the fate of the majority of the countries in low and middle income country was put in the hands of Serum Institute of India. And when the chips were down, the Serum Institute they had to stop, I mean, exporting to anybody because they felt that the first thing is to address their own local need first. You know, and uh, the entire low and middle income country, we were at a standstill, you know. So again, this further underscore the need for each and I mean every region to begin to have a way to manufacture its own air security commodities. And that's why your first question, I'm so impressed with that response that even in the EU, each and every member state should have what it takes to manufacture locally. You know, which is not different from our position as um, African Union and as uh, Africa CDC. So um, again, our, our head of state have clearly mandated us that that need to, that stands at one percent of our local need need to move to sixty percent of our local need by the year twenty forty. So we have that political support. Number four on the new public health order is the need for domestic resource mobilization. This agenda, whether we like it or not, is not, uh, is not going to fly without adequate financial resources, without adequate infrastructure, without adequate research and development. So domestic mobilization of resources in whatever form is critical, because that's the only way we can guarantee that, yes, we are able to sustain whatever support, you know, that is coming from the global north. Because I think mean, whether we like it or not, today we know that all the big farmers are in the global north, you know, but to move that agenda to the global south, 
you know, it will not come by goodwill alone. Let me use the description of uh, President uh, Paul Kagame, that you cannot guarantee air security by goodwill alone. We have to be proactive, you know, so we have to mobilize resources locally to support mm -hmm. that agenda. And last but not the least, we know that as African Union and as a member state, we cannot do it alone. We still need a partnership. We still need the private sector, you know. But what we are calling for is that that partnership arrangement need to be trusted, need to be respected, and need to be action oriented. Because that's the only way we can move this um, agenda forward. So really, I think uh, this topic is quite uh, critical and is coming at a very timely, I mean, um, at, the, at the right time for us as a continent. Because as you are aware, the, the African Union through our head of state and government, we have launched what we call Partnership for Africa Vaccine Manufacturing, PAVM. You know, and the framework for action of that is on our website. You know, and um, if time allow, if I'm allowed to come back again, I think I will shed um, some more light uh, on, on that, which is aimed at uh, first we start with a uh, vaccine, then of course we we'll shift there and go into, I um, mean, therapeutics, diagnostics, and so on and so forth. Um, thank you, and over to you, Ramco. <clears throat> Please do that. <clears throat> this is very clear. Also, one of those partners is uh, <laughs> SAPIN, of course, also the World Health Organization. Uh, Dr. Matthew, you have recently become a member of the WHO Technical Advisory Group for the Local Production Unit. Do you, do you view local production as a solution or regional production? I think we maybe need to see how we what will be then the de definition as a way to uh, to some of the shortage and autonomy issues. And what is the role that the WHO and the, and the local production forum can play in this? Thank you indeed, Remco, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity to join uh, this important discussion today. Um, and the simple answer to, to your question regarding is local production, is regional production important? The simple answer is yes. And the reason it's important is, as Taj has just been articulating, um, there is a need to have geodiversified vaccine manufacturing. There is arguably too much reliance on uh, a few core geographic centers for vaccine manufacturing and supply. This is a lesson learned from the COVID pandemic um, in terms of supply and equitable access to vaccines, particularly in Africa, but not solely in Africa, other places as well. So one of the strategies that CEPI has adopted is to support um, initiatives in underserved global South regions where vaccine manufacturing is a requirement uh, to further develop and improve the public health security. Now, this goes back actually a couple of years. CEPI undertook a survey back in 2021 on vaccine manufacturing capacity and capability initiatives in Africa, Latin America, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, and Western Pacific. And what that revealed uh, uh, overwhelmingly is the distribution of vaccine manufacturing, or dare I say, the lack of distribution, and hence the need, and in many of those responses was the call to support public health security through having regionalized vaccine manufacturing. Now, there is a danger with that that you go too far the other way, and every country wants to have a vaccine manufacturing footprint. If it goes that direction, then that is a build and bust scenario where you will build, let's say, 50 different vaccine manufacturing facilities, one in each country in Africa, let's say, um, and they don't have sustainability. They don't have a sufficient market demand for the vaccines that's manufactured within them to keep them warm-based, to keep the lights on. So there's a delicate balance here between ensuring a country or rather region has sufficient vaccine manufacturing capacity and capability, and also how it synchronizes, how it efficiently works together. And one of the questions I think you came up with a little earlier was, um, should the EU create more uh, vaccine production um, and arguably um, the answer to that is well no but not entirely I used the word in not entirely I noticed Ellen used an extender to her answer as well I'm using one as well I'm using the word entirely because I mean from a vaccine perspective the European Union is incredibly well served um, I used to chair the Vaccines Europe uh, Influenza Working Group I chaired that for about three years and I know from a fact from that that the European Union is, is incredibly well served, but also the European Union has incredible capability and capacity that can be leveraged to support, for example, vaccine manufacturing institutions 
and build up within areas of the world where it is underserved, particularly in some of the core disease areas that CEPI is interested in, which are the R&D blueprint pathogens. So things like Rift Valley Fever, Lassa, Nipper, um, Ebola, Chikungunya, et cetera. Um, now, what CEPI is doing is investing in initiatives and offer opportunity then to be instituted within regionalized, established regionalized vaccine manufacturing. So we are actually supporting, for example, in the Netherlands, um, Wageningen University, as they develop a Rift Valley fever vaccine. So there's an opportunity to develop an innovative vaccine for single dose administration could then, that could then be tech transferred, for example, uh, to a facility, let's say, in Africa. Um, we're working with Intravac on an intranasal uh, broadly protective beta coronavirus uh, vaccine. We're working with 20 med therapeutics to stabilize mRNA vaccine technology. And this speaks to how to support geodiversification of vaccine supply. mRNA vaccines need, of course, a minus 80 storage condition. That's not feasible in many parts of the world, not just in underserved regions, in the UK as well, where I'm based. Um, you know, minus, uh, minus 80 freezers are expensive. Uh, they're big, they're, they have high running costs, et cetera. So to stabilize mRNA vaccine offers opportunity to support vaccine supply, manufacture and geodistribution, particularly in geographically challenging environments and remote settings, remote communities. Um, we're working with Batavia for manufacturing Nipah and Lassa vaccines, both of which, of course, are diseases prevalent in uh, the global south regions. So there would be vaccines that could be transitioned to localized or regional production closer to where the disease is to facilitate vaccine uptake, to facilitate equitable access, to facilitate that speed and that scale required. Um, just to continue this theme, we're working with virus science department at the Erasmus Medical Center on a MERS vaccine. We're working with Janssen on an Ebola vaccine. We're working with Viral Clinics who are now a member of CEPI's centralized laboratory network, which we also have increased in Africa as well. And this network is to facilitate monitoring vaccine administration, disease outbreaks, and facilitating clinical trial monitoring, for example. So there's a number of areas that need to be thought about, not just from within a high income European, for example, uh, region, but how to support vaccine manufacturing, particularly in underserved regions and, and the global south. And that is certainly something that CEPI is focusing on and has started uh, with a preferred vaccine manufacturing facility network. So mm. I'll stop there and look forward to further. Thank you for that. So we had a good first round to get a clear overview. Um, Louisa, over to you. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I actually want to uh, follow up with a question to uh, uh, Dr. Tash. Uh, um, and I wanted to ask, you know, how bad has been the COVID-19 pandemic when we saw that the most wealthy countries were working to get as many vaccines for themselves as they could? Um, and and what what does that mean, let's say, for the current uh, situation? Um, do you expect, you know, uh, with the shortages of other medical products to have these types of risks as well? How can we avoid and how can Europe and Africa also cooperate to avoid, let's say, such shortages and vulnerabilities? And also what came to my mind was the current situation with the bird flu in Europe, where we have a high risk of spread over. And I know that Matt, you also already talked about influenza briefly and has a great expertise on this. So are we now better prepared um, and what could we do, you know, in the coming uh, period to 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 accelerate this cooperation between uh, Africa and and Europe and how how do you view this um, uh, this this situation, Dr. Tash? No, no, no. thank you, thank you, at least for that uh, uh, question. So let me say that um, uh, between EU and um, AU, there is that um, strategic um, uh, sort of a uh, cooperation between the two um, institutions, and then um, every year there is always that. AU EU uh, sort of um, summit. Uh, the last one took place in um, in uh, Brussels, where the the head of state from our side and from the other side had um, uh, some uh, engagement. And one of the issues there is um, the aspect of um, global health. Uh, let me also say that the new um, EU global health um, strategy that is currently being looked at closely at 
has also been um, shared with us to um, take a look and see how do we coordinate, collaborate um, in that um, uh, uh, space. Because as we are all aware, uh, when it comes to diseases, when it comes to epidemics, uh, the, this uh, uh, sort of thing that no no boundary at all, you know. So uh, in terms of our uh, uh, specifics, I, I think um, we've had um, a lot of support uh, from um, uh, from EU. There's no doubt about that. Even on the Partnership for Vaccine Manufacturing um, agenda, we have um, a lot of support coming uh, from uh, um, EU to really move that um, agenda um, forward because the framework of um, I mean, action for the uh, PABM has a couple of um, um, areas, including um, research and development, you know, which are uh, working closely with um, our colleagues and a lot of institutions uh, from EU, the regulatory and science, you know, setting up regional centers of excellence, I think it's also working um, uh, very well. Even in terms of the actual um, setting up of manufacturing plants, I think uh, we've made significant progress with um, uh, the EU uh, uh, big uh, farmer. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, about five of our head of state were in the Germany to have a very robust discussion with Biotech uh, to see mm -hmm. how do we work together to set up I mean, uh, uh, plants uh, on the continent of uh, um, Africa. So really, I think that has worked out uh, very well. Now, whether we are prepared uh, for the next pandemic, I think my answer for now will still be no. You know, I think we are preparing, but not prepared. Uh, as you are aware, a lot of discussion is still ongoing on the need to revise the international health regulation. You know, yeah. a lot of discussion is ongoing on the pandemic, um, a, a, a treaty or pandemic um, accord, you know, which is going to serve as a governance um, structure for the way uh, we address some of these air security um, uh, issues. We also know that in terms of financing pandemic and epidemic, uh, the pandemic fund is out there, uh, but still a lot of questions unanswered. Mm -hmm. uh, today, 600 million was uh, put out there and the request is up to 4 point something billion. So again, uh, that leaves uh, more, more questions to answer. You know, So really, uh, there's still um, a lot um, to do in that space. And then just, about, uh, uh, just a quick reaction to one of Matthew's uh, comments, and um, each and every member state should not go into manufacturing. I completely agree with you. And that's why for us on the continent of Africa, and uh, again, thanks to CEPI, I think we're working closely on our PAVM I mean, um, agenda. It's a regional approach. Even the aspect of regulation, we are looking at regional centers of excellence for regulatory I mean, uh, sciences. So regional approach is what work, and I see how each and every member state, we key into that value chain. You know, if one, one country manufactures the active pharmaceutical ingredient, then another country should be able to do the fill and finish, something like that. Even some of the raw materials, another country should be able to go um, into that. Because the big question is, if every member state manufactures, then who is going to buy it? You get it? So I think um, really a regional or sub-regional approach um, is uh, uh, the way to go. And um, again, uh, thanks to EU, I think uh, we've been working together you know, and uh, we continue to work together. Even Africa CDC and European CDC, uh, we have a very strong collaboration. Africa CDC and Robert Court Institute, we have strong collaboration to support, you know, on the key public health um, agenda on the continent of um, Africa. Thank you, and over to you, Liz. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, as a moderator, of course, I hope to see more uh, uh, discussion and also more divergences of opinion, but let's say from a international relations and cooperation perspective, of course, it's welcomed <laughs> that you uh, that you see a lot of potential for this cooperation. And uh, uh, but let's see. I would also like to encourage the people who participate in the webinar. Some people are already posing questions. Uh, and uh, please uh, do so and also please point to these issues where you might expect, you know, there is some more difficulties uh, because that's, of course, always the most uh, uh, difficult issues uh, that we need also to resolve eventually uh, to be to get to this higher level of pr uh, preparedness, but also to to address the, 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 the regular issues of access to medicines, the costs of health and uh, uh also the the justice in this field and then that, that all people uh, have equal access to to medicine um, yeah thank you so much uh, um then i would like to move on and i have actually also prepared another question 
for uh, Matthew Downham uh, from CEPI. And uh, Matthew, you're already mentioning that you are you were part of this influenza group in the EU. Currently, you're also a member of the World Health Organization Advisory Group on Local Production and Technology Transfer of Health uh, Products. Um, uh, and I think that's quite interesting that it's also focusing on this tech transfer issue that has already been uh, come up in, in earlier uh, parts of this uh, discussion. Um, so how do you see the role of tech transfer in improving access to medical products, both in Africa and Europe? And how, uh, how do you actually do that? Is that a minister walking with a suitcase with intellectual property rights and know how uh, uh, to Africa? Uh, I always wonder, you know, how, how can you make that kind of uh, easy to understand for, for a wider audience? And also, what role can we really play, the EU and the Netherlands, let's say beyond, you know, uh, giving funds for technology transfer, which is undoubtedly also needed. Uh, but how can you really accelerate uh, this, this know-how and, and tech transfer issue? Please, Matthew, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, Louise, and some very important questions there. So just the position tech transfer. Um, so the means by which this is, is done is, is quite a, a lengthy process. It can take a year, it can take two years to effect tech transfer. And the benefits of tech transfer are, is basically the innovation, the improvement in maybe the speed or the scale, the way that the vaccines can be manufactured and, and leveraged within a within a, a particular country. So let's say you have a manufacturing plant that has a more traditional platform technology and a more novel platform technology comes along or a way of maybe propagating cells or purifying the vaccine or filling and, and finishing the vaccine come along. Then it's important that those improvements, those contemporary modernizations of the vaccine process are implemented equally so in the uh, global south in a geodiverse uh, region, a, a region requiring that geodiversification to improve such things as their speed for vaccine manufacture, to improve the quality of the products, to include, uh, to improve the, the rate at which the vaccines can be manufactured and the standardization with regulatory acceptance and, and requirements, globally speaking. So it's all about ensuring modernization and improvements such that the best quality products can be offered to people equally in the geodiverse regions as they are elsewhere on, on the planet. And so this often requires tech transfer from where those technologies exist, let's say in the European Union, to a facility, let's say, in Africa. And SAPI is very much engaged in one such particular activity with the Institute Pasteur in Dakar in Senegal to improve their capacity and their capability to manufacture vaccines using a novel process of suspension cell technology. So we're working on that aspect. Now, where that comes into the complexity is not just the, the tech transfer, the, the, the material, the, the engineering, but you also have to train people. <clears throat> You're instituting a new um, skill set requirement, and sometimes it includes new analytical requirement. And so this is where I think the Netherlands can really provide some great support in terms of the training elements required. So when people are trained, they have to have various forms of training. They have to have that remote, let's say, classroom based training, but they also need to get their hands dirty. They need to work physically on the new piece of equipment. They need to do the assays. They need to be able to reproducibly work within the new environment that has been tech transferred. And that arguably is where the, where the Netherlands can can really step in. And I have had conversations with the Dutch uh, Vaccine Task Force in the past uh, about offering this very facility, such that technology that's maybe transferred from the Netherlands to, let's say, Africa, um, the folks that are receiving that technology in Africa have that opportunity to work closely with the Netherlands to gain that understanding, that expertise, and that hands-on experience per se as well. So there's a much bigger kind of global health positioning discussion going on here. And this is what will be factored into the World Local Production Forum that, of course, the Netherlands is, is, is organizing and co-hosting uh, a little later uh, this year, literally in a, in a number of months' time. Um, and this is what the Local Production Assistance Unit of the WHO is, is kind of its main forum. So it's to talk through what's required to diversify vaccine manufacturing. It's not just about building the bricks and mortar. 
It's what roads, what infrastructure, what training needs are required, what free flow of goods is needed, how do consumables reach the facility and how do the products get from the facility outside of the border to the respective regional countries that that facility supports. It's how to ensure the training and how the coordination of the broader global community is needed to support those endeavors, not just from an investment perspective, which is key and is definitely coming from the European Union and many others as well, but how to coordinate and ensure the efficiencies such that the maximum impact is felt and, and had. So tech transfer is a key element for basically modernization to improve the speed, the scale, the access to vaccines by bringing in novel technologies to facilitate that. But with that comes all the commensurate um, hurdles and challenges. They're not insurmountable, but the hurdles and challenges that need to be addressed. And one of the key ones is training, is workforce development. Over. Mm -hmm. Workforce development. Do you agree with that, uh, Dr. Tash? Is that one of the key hurdles? Uh, surely, surely. And um, for the Partnership for Africa Vaccine Manufacturing, I think that's a critical component, you know, mm -hmm. of the framework for uh, for action, you know, training in terms of our research and development, training in terms of our regulatory um, sciences, training in terms of uh, even, I mean, uh, on the, 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 the so-called tech transfer that will come from the global north, you know, how do we navigate that? On the job mm -hmm. tree, so and um, uh, we're glad that uh, we started a lot of work uh, in that space, and uh, we need all the support that will allow us to move um, this particular I mean um, agenda forward. For instance, with um, so I mean the South Korea and the International Vaccine Institute there, uh, we have that uh, memorandum of cooperation that is allowing some of our our people to go there, get the required um, training, and come back and uh, support uh, the, the, the the local manufacturing um, agenda. So really, yeah. uh, capacity building is key. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a really uh, a a fascinating point, I think. Uh, and then if we have produced the medicine, then we might still have problems with getting these access to these medicines. And then I think, Ellen, it would be really interesting to, to bring your uh, perspective in, uh, because I know that you have also been uh, very active in um, a court case against a pharmaceutical company uh, called Abvi. Abvi. Uh, FV, uh, and uh, they uh, produce a uh, medicine that is used to treat uh, rheumaticus and uh, psoriasis, and it's called Mira. And um, uh, health economists found out that uh, uh, they really made an excessive profit on selling this medicine because very often, uh, if you've developed a new medicine and if you're the only provider of this medicine, then uh, you're protected and you can ask basically almost the price that you want and this is exactly what this case is about is that acceptable uh, and um, how can we avoid uh, the situation and uh, I know that you've also spoken about this extensively in a recent podcast by uh, uh, Follow the Money, the podcast is in Dutch uh, but I would recommend the viewers of this webinar in Dutch that they also listen to that because I think that was also an excellent perspective in, in your viewpoints on this issue of how uh, let's say also the structure of uh, development of medicine and the affordability subsequently of this uh, of this medicine uh, influences the issue of access to health. Uh, even yeah, that's eventually uh, the issue. So, Ellen, could you uh, elaborate a bit more on this issue, on this aspect? And if you want to um, comment on other issues that have been brought up by the other speakers, also please feel free to to do so. Please. Yes, th thank you. Yes, I, I would like to start with that because I would like to comment a little bit on the on, on the previous discussion on the technology transfer, which is a, a really very very important uh, topic, and it will and it will also require in some situations the transfer of the intellectual property, but not. Um, and we've seen that with COVID uh, COVID nineteen, where there was untapped manufacturing capacity um, that could not get hold of the. Um, of access to, uh, to, to the intellectual property because those who held those rights refused to license and refused to, to transfer, uh, transfer the, the, the technology. But there is a, there's an interesting development going on in, um, in Africa where uh, South Africa has, um, has in, in a way 
um, developed its own uh, mRNA uh, uh, plat platform, sort of reverse engineers in the way you 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 also see that with the smaller with the smaller molecules so far without the collaboration of the of the originator, but with the collaboration of the WHO and many others have been involved in that. And this will be the technology transfer hub. So this is a tech transfer initiative, an African tra tech transfer initiative that will then transfer this technology to those that have the capacity to take it up in other countries, in other regions, such as uh, Brazil, Argentina is involved in that, or countries in Asia involved in that. So that is, I think, a very interesting um, uh, development that um, that really deserves uh, deserves attention, uh, but we should not underestimate the difficulty of persuading those that own the IP and the technology to transfer it. And here's a responsibility for those who are often involved in financing significant amounts of the of the cost of the R and D. Those are uh, those are are often governments, but SIPI is also also involved in that to attach stricter conditions on that financing so that that tech transfer is not based on on begging but actually becomes a legal obligation when there is significant uh, government financing which is often the case with uh, with vaccines so th that may be a way to to move that uh, move that forward um now on the uh, on the afi on the afi case I'm, i uh, that case was brought by the um Foundation for Pharmaceutical Accountability. I'm on the advisory board of the of the foundation, so I'm not. I don't have any sort of direct involvement in the case in the case it's, uh, itself. But it is. It's an interesting case that shows how much excessive profits a company can make. And this group of health economists had calculated that that was in the Netherlands 1.2 billion uh, euros, and that 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 1.2 billion is on top of um, the cost of the research and development for the product, the production cost, and a 25% uh, profit profit margin. And that 1.2 billion, of course, is comes out of the Dutch healthcare system. And the foundation is arguing in this case that this displaces other healthcare. And by doing so, there are human rights issues uh, involved uh, involved as well. Um, the um, and this, of course, touches on on access issues more general because, as a society, um, it's good to have the discussion. How much money do you want to pull out of the public sector and give to the private sector in excess profits? I mean, a significant amount you may want to spend because you want to have the research and development and all kinds of other wonderful things happen. But when is enough enough? And that that question is not. Uh, not uh, not often enough uh, 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 asked. Um, now, of course, a, a court case like this cannot solve the problem. For that, you need uh, you need also uh, governments to, uh, to to step in and and play a role. But I think that this case can demonstrate the extent of which uh, this uh, the excessive profit actually affects the healthcare. Uh, system system as a whole, and with this, we're we're coming back to the question: you know, what is our, actually at the core of the access access to medicines challenges? Because the way we finance research and development um, is is very much at the heart of of many of the pro problems. Not only the high prices because of the exclusive rights, because that is the predominant model. You, the financing of research and development is, is, is mostly done by granting exclusive rights, patents, exclusive marketing rights, data exclusivity, orphan drug exclusivity, you name it. And But that comes with costs, not only in terms of high prices, but also in terms of research and development priority setting, because the, the R&D will focus on those products that can ultimately be sold in wealthy nations at high prices. And that leaves a lot of neglect, that leaves neglect of uh, products for which the markets aren't large enough, neglect for products that affect mostly poor people um, in, in disadvantaged um, areas. Uh, but you also see a, a drive to, to, towards lower and lower prices of the older medicines, and you see the older medicines disappearing from the market. And all of that can somehow 
in, in some way be brought back to that core principle of uh, how as a, as, as, as a Western society we have decided to finance the R&D. And that would be interesting to explore uh, alternative models for that. We've seen in the field of, and again, there's a lot of innovation in Africa going on, uh, for example, an initiative like the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative that has taken and takes an entirely different approach towards financing research and development. And there are possibly lessons to be learned for um, for us as well from those uh, from those initiatives. Over. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Eh? You have the diseases which are called neglected diseases that uh, that only few people have, and therefore there is not enough financial incentives for the regular pharmaceutical companies to go into these diseases. But then, you know, funds have become made available to to engage in R and D into these diseases, and um, then, of course, uh, um, once the patents are there, that will be also available at a at a lower price. So you mean that you can learn from that for also the um, well, the new maybe uh, bird flu outbreaks uh, vaccines that will need to be developed, well, or or antibiotic drug development. I mean, yeah. we have to recognize that uh, uh, certain needs, societal needs, will not be met by by market. Um, yeah. market forces and then you can try to create more market dynamics to make it happen or you can yeah. step in and say let's let's mm -hmm. just finance it straightforward yeah yeah i was also reflecting on this webinar and because we do in Klingenau so much work also in strategic autonomy in other sectors not only in health and i was thinking yeah you know here we are not dependent on china for the critical raw materials but here we're dependent on on a structure uh, and, and a pharmaceutical industry and the relationship between R and D and 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 availability uh, at affordable prices of of these medicines. So it's a different kind of uh, strategic autonomy uh, question, if you like. Um, I would like to go over back to Remco, and I saw that there are already quite a lot of interesting questions being posted. In yes, the uh, thank you. There has yeah. indeed been uh, interaction. Thank you for the questions. More questions are still welcome, but I will uh, give uh, each of the each of the speakers one one question coming from the chat from Nick Brontenbal and to um, to Matthew. How prepared are we if a major bird flu outbreak among people were to occur right now? Would we run into the same shortage and distribution and equity problems like we had with COVID nineteen? Matthew. <clears throat> Oh, thank you indeed for that question, and thank you, Nick, for you, for posting it. Um, so the simple answer there is that it is possible that we will hit the same inequity or similar inequity problems as we did for COVID, but not to the same extent. And the reason I caveat my answer like that is because the, the global flu vaccine manufacturers, of which there's a substantial number, are, are well placed to respond to a pandemic flu outbreak. They're working on seasonal flu vaccine literally all year round whether they're serving both the North and Southern Hemisphere or just one of the hemispheres. Um, they're working on that, on that program, that platform technology year round. So there's an infrastructure in place that's working on the actual disease and on the vaccine platform technology that if or when a pandemic flu outbreaks occurs, outbreak occurs, they can switch from making seasonal to pandemic flu using the same processes. Those processes have been ongoing for many years, and the WHO has had uh, input, input into the flu for nearly 70 years. It's had a pandemic influenza preparedness framework for, for some time as well, not quite 70 years. Um, and that has also put in place um, secured supply of pandemic flu vaccines for distribution in global south regions that are largely underserved. Now, that percentage is about 10% of a production yield for each respective vaccine manufacturer. So that does not amount to sufficient vaccine for all of the global south. And there is still elements of risk of inequity, again, because the vaccine manufacturers, there aren't sufficient flu vaccine manufacturers in the global south. This needs to be improved. This needs to be addressed. So there needs to be an improvement in the amount of seasonal flu vaccine manufacturing capability and capacity in the global south, such that if or when a pandemic flu vaccine is required, those facilities can pivot, they can switch to supply their respective region with pandemic flu. 
So the fact that there's some element of already cover uh, advanced purchase or advanced supply agreements in place will mitigate some of the risk. It will not eradicate the risk entirely. And this is why there needs to be an, an improvement in flu vaccine capacity and capability in the global south as well. Because at the moment, it's very high income country orientated from where most of the flu vaccines are supplied from globally. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you very much. And of course, it's a little bit in the, in the mind of people now, how we anticipate, okay. how do we prepare for such a, an, an outbreak that seems to be quite likely and how not to make the same mistake. So yeah, um, I'm going uh, to uh, to Tash and it's a, it's a question, combined question on governance from uh, Mali Kachavos, if I pronounce that right. Um, it's about the new pandemic treaty and international health regulations. What is the role there of local slash regional production capacity on on in the perspective of the African CDC? And also, how does it relate this to equity in relation to uh, to medical products, uh, vaccines, and also the whole access and benefit sharing debate? Huh? There's a requirement in the new pandemic treaty to share to share um, uh, data and 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 data of pathogens. Uh, more quickly, but what 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 is in it for the for the African CDC? What are the key your key points for these new uh, regulations um, uh, that from the from the African side are important to consider? Rush, I hope the the uh, the question is clear. No, no, it, it, it's clear. I, I saw it in the in the chat box. Yeah, no, no, no. Thank you, um, Aramco, for this uh, particular um, uh, question. Uh, so, um, I think a couple of reflections in that space. We quite aware that the IHR revision is um, ongoing. Uh, a lot of discussion is ongoing around the pandemic uh, uh, treaty. And um, we know that uh, quite a couple of our member states have been engaged to be part of that discussion. And uh, what we've done as Africa CDC is actually to build the capacity of our member states so that uh, they can make meaningful contribution to that discussion that is ongoing. Okay, because that will affect how the outcome of that discussion impact us as a continent of 1.3 billion people and 55 uh, member states. So that is one. Now, in terms of um, the content and as it affects local uh, manufacturing, I think um, uh, for us, this is critical for our continent. You know, especially the aspect of tech transfer and the patent and waiver, especially when it comes to disease outbreak. You know, you know, for the routine issues, uh, no, no, no problem. You know, but when it comes to disease outbreak, when we know that um, the consequences of our inaction or lack of access to some of those medical countermeasures far, far, far outweigh whatever benefit. We are talking of that we accrue from um, the so-called um, IP, you know, that the intellectual property patent um, a waiver. So really, uh, I think going forward, the, the, the position of our continency remains very clear that when it comes to emergency, there is need for the relevant authorities, especially WTO, to really ensure that there is that patent waiver that will allow equitable access, you know, to this uh, medical countermeasure, because it's all about saving lives. You know, and of what use is those good that will save life when it comes very, very late into the pandemic, when lives have been lost needlessly. So really, we want to see uh, that aspect covered, you know, and covered in such a way that it ensures equitable access, you know, to these uh, medical uh, countermeasures. In terms of um, sharing data, sharing um, evidence and um, benefit and um, sharing uh, as well. So I think for us at Africa CDC, uh, uh, this need to be combined. We all knew what happened uh, in one of the flu and then um, Indonesia, I mean, um, uh, where the, the country to provide the evidence and when the benefit came up, I mean, Indonesia were last in line, you know, to benefit from the, the, the vaccines and going forward, they refused to share any further uh, uh, document. Of course, we call names and do all those things, but I think uh, going forward, tied to sharing of um, data, tied to sharing of uh, evidence, we need to have a robust way of sharing benefit as well. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion on this platform today about the role the public played for the private sector to come up with these medical countermeasures. You get it? But when those 
I mean, the, 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 the product <clears throat> were developed. I think uh, we forgot about where we came from. You know, I think uh, there were more emphasis on the, the intellectual property, there were more emphasis on, um, I mean, I don't want to call it profit and so on and so forth. But I think going forward, we need to have a robust governance, I mean, uh, architecture in place that will allow benefit sharing to be tied to data sharing or evidence um, uh, uh, um, sharing. And this also brings us to the, 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 the ethics, you know, aspect of, I mean, uh, uh, of the whole uh, uh, pandemic and the way we respond to them. You know, I think we need to also apply that ethics lens, you know, because benefit sharing, whether we like it or not, is a key, I mean, uh, is a serious ethical issue. So really, I think going forward, we need to find a way that our framework for this ethical consideration need to clearly, clearly address the issue of uh, uh, benefit and sharing agreement when it comes to, I mean, uh, uh, disease outbreak and, um, and, uh, and, and, and data. Over to you, Rampo. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, thank you, and and we, uh, of course, is already covered also under the Nagoya Protocol on biodiversity, and uh, so there there is already governance mechanisms, and I guess governance is is key indeed to get this further, and this is uh, on the negotiation negotiation at the moment in uh, in Geneva. I go to uh, to Ellen, um, and I take a, a question from uh, Tala Dolatshayi. Um, and we have not talked so much about the World Trade Organization, the TRIPS agreement uh, from 1994, the, in, the, the whole intellectual property regime, uh, how it's being established. And it's a little bit also because in, in global health, we talk a lot about decoloniality and decolonizing initiatives to make local slash regional production possible. Uh, and what is then required uh, more structurally in, uh, in, in the governance of, of, of what the WTO or the IMF or the World Health Organization is doing. Um, can you shed your light on this? <clears throat> yeah, th th thank you. Thank you for that, for that question. There's, of course, the last, uh, last couple of years been a, a lot of discussion at the World Trade Organization on COVID-19 access to vaccines and as, as a result of the proposal by South Africa and India for a TRIPS waiver during the pandemic, which would have meant uh, if it had been adopted the way it was originally proposed, that uh, WTO member states uh, no longer would be obliged to enforce uh, intellectual patents predominantly on uh, on products needed to combat the uh, the, the pandemic. Um, the uh, but I I think that there is um, what's interesting is that that discussion has focused. Uh, again, uh, the attention uh, a bit more on the, on the on the TRIPS agreement and how much uh, flexibility that TRIPS agreement actually actually uh, offers. And it is my view that countries can actually, and particularly on on a on, on a regional basis, uh, take quite a lot of action under the TRIPS agreement uh, already. Um, and that I, I don't only. I do not only refer to measures such as compulsory licensing, but there is also a, a security exception in the TRIPS agreement that could have been uh, that could have been in, that can be invoked if that is uh, if that is needed. But where there isn't sufficient, or I think we should give more attention to uh, the objectives and the principles of the TRIPS agreement because those are very interesting, and I sometimes call. Um, you know, tech transfer is, is one of the unfulfilled promises of the TRIPS agreement because part of the bargain in 95 when, or 94 when the TRIPS agreement was, was concluded that all countries would adopt uh, a certain level of protection of intellectual property it was recognized that that would come with, with costs for countries uh, that had to, uh, had, had to significantly extend the levels of protection of, of, of intellectual property, but in exchange, there would be technology transfer, significant technology transfer. And that part of the bargain has not really been fulfilled. And um, that is a discussion, there should be more discussion at the WTO on that. There is one article in the TRIPS agreement specifically on technology transfer, but that only creates obligations uh, on high-income countries to encourage tech transfer to 
LDCs, the least developed countries, that is a group of about 35 poorest countries in the world, those are usually not the countries that can actually uptake at this stage the, the, the technology. It is the, the, the countries at the levels above that, and those are not part of that of that article. So that is something that needs to needs to be addressed. And it's interesting that this discussion is now shifting to the negotiations of the pandemic treaty because tech transfer and the creating stronger obligations to make it happen. That is what the pandemic treaty should do. I'm, I'm a little worried that the treaty has all the correct themes in it. But if you look at the draft, as, well, as far as we can, because unfortunately negotiations have moved behind closed doors, but as far as we can see where the text is going, um, the themes may all be there, but in terms of operational paragraphs, creating new duties, new obligations for countries, it is still very, very weak. And it would be a missed opportunity if this issue of, of tech transfer wasn't addressed uh, more firmly uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the pandemic treaty. But I also predict that this is a discussion that will be brought back to the TRIPS Council, to the World Trade Organization, because the TRIPS Agreement very explicitly has technology transfer as one of its core, if not the core objective. Okay. Thank you um, for this. There are some questions coming. Um, please ask more as well. I don't know if Louise want to come in with a question. Otherwise, I have several Maybe. also now. Maybe just one small follow-up question. How do the speakers view the perspective of agreeing on this uh, pandemic treaty also in light of the geopolitical tensions that almost overshadow everything in international politics uh, nowadays? Is that affecting also the negotiations of the pandemic treaty? Or do you think the 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 history of the COVID-19 pandemic is not still so recent and, and this has impacted so much that a pandemic treaty can still be agreed upon at, at the international level. I don't, I'm not sure if you're willing to say something about that, but I would be definitely very much interested in, say, the perspective of the, of the great power politics that are going on in relationship to this field. For the public health colleagues in this webinar, indeed, this is hosted by the International Relations Institute, so this question is very appropriate. Does somebody has an answer to that or would like to answer to well, it? Well, look, this is it's it is not the kumbaya period of multilateral you know, re relationships, but it is what is it, it is it is necessary. And I think it's uh, and I'm not a non expert in this field, but I, I I'm often 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 part of these. Uh, of these processes and shouldn't underestimate the value of countries talking to each other. And luckily soon they can be doing that more, more face to face. Although in a way, moving the entire world of global health negotiations to Zoom has also led to some more democratization of, the, of these discussions because the levels of participation have been very high from, from many, many different, from many different countries. But these are, um, these are the kind of issues that the whole world collectively needs to needs, needs to be part of the uh, part of the solution and it's no denying that you know, the, 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 the huge tensions that are that are currently uh, that currently exist um, uh, of course also fil filter through in those in those negotiations um, but if you talk about pandemic preparedness and protecting humanity, you need to do that collectively. Global public goods and a collaboration in that regard. Um, I have first a follow-up question for Matt and afterwards for Tash. People do come in with questions. It's still possible for a last round. Uh, but for Matt, you, um, so there's a question in the, in the chat also about, uh, we have to make sure that we have new antibiotics when the, when the old ones no longer work. And from this global glo global public good perspective, and we have there's also the reference to the patents pool, and we have now an mRNA technical uh, tech transfer hub, and we had CTAP, and where you we so the, the mechanisms are there. Uh, Ellen has been working also as a, the first director of the medicine patent pool, so the whole promises are there. But still, when we look at the implementation, we see that there's limited financing, both from the from the public and both from the from the private side, I think that's also one of the reasons what SAPI 
had been originated in the in the first part. How can we now move from promises to real implementation? Huh? What are the incentives really to get both the, the private sector and uh, public authorities in, impl in implementing these, these mechanisms under the World Health Organization and others that do exist? Um, so thank you, Remco. That's a, that's a massive question. Whether I'll be able to answer it in ten minutes is <laughs> another thing altogether. But certainly, you're absolutely right. There have been a considerable number of, of promises and thoughts regarding what's required from a vaccine or a public health provision situation. And in fact, uh, you're right. CEPI was founded, let's say, in 2017 on the basis of the Ebola outbreak that I think was in the Democratic of. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo that year. And it, that's when it was recognized that there was a need to underpin the diseases and the disease areas that are not supported or funded, um, possibly because of the sporadic or the limited number of cases per year, etc. And all of that now has come to a point in post-COVID world in terms of the, co the coordination to maximize efficiencies. Um, and so jumping forward again from a Davos perspective, when CEPI was, was formed uh, a couple of years ago, CEPI, together with the World Economic Forum and the National Academy of Medicine, formed the Regionalized Vaccine Manufacturing Collaborative. And what this collaborative is trying to do is think about not just the coordination of the financing, but the coordination of the vaccine manufacturing initiatives, the research and development. The RVMC to date has got about 50 or 60 uh, members on board that span government, non-government organizations, regulatory agencies, manufacturers, um, civil society organizations, etc., to try and focus on how to coordinate the considerable amount of interest there is to address the main gaps, the main opportunities that exist, whether it's not just antibiotics, but in terms of global public health initiatives, in terms of ensuring sustainability, ensuring coordination, uh, for supply of public health measures and interventions. Um, you mentioned also a number of things there about the pandemic fund a moment ago. And of course, the Netherlands is closely involved uh, in this as a partner and implementing partner of the pandemic uh, preparedness fund and also the pandemic treaty uh, as an intergovernmental negotiating body. And it's about getting people to the table to have those discussions and coordinate um, the, the overall global efforts such that Let's say, for example, there's multiple inroads of financing and support into, let's say, Africa, that that financing is appropriately channeled and efficiently managed such that we don't establish a vaccine manufacturing facility in every uh, African country, because that will be a, a build and bust scenario. So it's how to coordinate, how to manage those efficiencies, and, and as has been indicated, against what's an increasingly political focus. Many governments, many member states now recognize the importance of having public health security um, in the light of the COVID pandemic. Uh, Dr. Taj mentioned it earlier uh, about the impact of Africa on India closing its borders, therefore preventing Serum Institute of India shipping vaccines to Africa in the COVID pandemic. That kind of ramification impacts member states as they make key decisions on how to meet public health security measures moving forwards and that and that is where there's this close need for coordination uh, to maximize efficiencies mm. coordination and governance huh? but that's where so that it comes in a little bit to this what what would such a balance and reciprocal uh, partnership look like huh? so it's as, as, as also mentioned by the african tdc a trusted partnership and where there's really a balance between the actors involved. The question I had to uh, to Raj is, um, so what about local needs? And we talk a lot now about the introduction of, uh, of vaccines and new medical products to deal with problems. But from a public health perspective, that's a, quite of a biomedical solution to issues that are also related to the social ecological conditions, inequities, impoverishment in many of the of the states. So how does the biomedical investment links to more broader public health needs that you think that I think you're also working on in, in African CDC? No, no, thank you, thank you, Ramko. If, if I get your, your, your question right, 
Uh, let, let, let me start with the, we have the agenda 2030, which is the, 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 the sustainable development goal. And for us at uh, the African Union, we have the agenda 2063, which is our own social economy blueprint. Now, if you look at that agenda, uh, what the agenda has tried to do is to get the framing of health, to get it right. So that we begin to see health, not just as a medical issue. We also seen it is a social, is economic, and it's also a developmental issue, especially when it comes to the continent of Africa. And that takes us to the issue of um, the social determinants of health, you know, which I believe um, it's uh, what essentially you are, are, are looking at here, that beyond the medical countermeasures, you know, what are those other socioeconomic issues? that needs to be um, addressed, you know. And uh, again, looking at the COVID-19 pandemic, I think that's one other area. I mean, one particular area where Africa CDs was able to demonstrate the importance of that multi-sectoral, you know, and uh, multidisciplinary approach to um, health uh, uh, issues, <laughs> you know. So um, we are looking at all these things um, holistically, you know, so that beyond the medical needs, what are the social economic issues tied to this? You know, and working with the relevant sectors, you know, I think we are able to address some of these um, issues. So, for instance, when you look at the key stakeholders in the way Africa CDC responded, the development banks were part and parcel of that, um, that, 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 that group. The telecommunication industry were part and parcel of that group. The travel industry, part and parcel of that group. The private sector, looking at poverty, I mean, alleviation and all those stuff were all part and parcel of that group. So this is where we are looking at it, to look at health beyond just our medical issues, bringing the relevant sectors on board and being able to address uh, some of these um, issues. Now, on the question of antibiotics, the new one, when the old ones are not working uh, very well, I think we need a very strong program on the, the antimicrobial um, resistance, especially the AMR I mean, um, surveillance. I think that needs to be very, very strong, especially in a setting like ours, whereby the fake and counterfeit um, drugs, you know, are the order of the day. You know, so you need a very robust, and these are some of the reasons why the African Medicine Agency was set up in the first um, instance. You know, so before we get to that stage where, I mean, the old ones are no longer working, I think we need to do everything possible to make sure that, and uh, to make sure that they don't get to that stage where they're no longer working. You know, to make sure that uh, that antimicrobial resistance, I mean, the program uh, is very strong, address the issue of fake and counterfeit drugs, address the issue of um, appropriate use and deployment of um, uh, antimicrobial, because uh, coming up with new antimicrobial is not an easy thing and it's not a day job. And I'm sure, I mean, um, SEPI colleagues we agree with me here that um, coming up with new ones should be the last result. Let's do everything possible to make sure that we do not find ourselves at that particular, I mean, level, especially from the developing world, I mean, point of view, whereby it takes an average of 10 years between when you have a new product, you know, and when that product gets, you know, uh, when uh, people in the lower and middle income country have equitable access to that product, it takes average of 10 years. So what happened in that, in that period of 10 years? So that would be my own submission. Uh, thank you. Thank you, uh, Tash, for this um, answer. Quite nuanced. Um, I think we're running almost out of time, so I will give Ellen uh, um, the uh, last uh, set of questions, which can be a bit framed as there's been a there's been a paper and a discussion about rebooting the the R and D ecosystem so that it fits for purpose. Huh? Um, there's questions about how can essential medicines that are not patented, for, in, for instance, a rifampicin still be provided huh? with generic production. Well, how, what's the role also of China in this uh, in this ecosystem uh, in the in the future? From your own kind of work that you're doing vis-a-vis uh, Abvis, -vis, what kind of lessons are coming from there? So it's really what kind of uh, priorities and, and and needs and steps are required to take this agenda forward. With that, uh, I leave the big question to the end for you. <laughs> Thank you. How many hours have I got? Three minutes. <laughs> I, I I think um, I think on 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 R R and D and uh, a greater role for 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 the public sector in both priority setting and in financing and subsequently managing 
those innovations I think would be would be important. I think the the role of the pharmaceutical industry will continue to be very significant because there that's also where a lot of the a lot of the expertise sits, but more and more also in smaller in smaller companies. But I would, what I would like to see on the access side um, is companies adopting real access strategies, not, not of the window dressing variety, real access, and some companies do, and that they make the um, licensing, what's sometimes called voluntary licensing, a core part of that strategy. There's more and more discussion about that these days. There's, of course, now more than 10 years experience with the medicines patent pool, and that experience has been very good. Medicines patent pool also plays an important role in various COVID-19 products and also in the in the COVID-19 or in the mRNA hub in, um, in, in South Africa. Uh, they've been successful in infectious diseases, but for uh, communic for non-communicable diseases, companies are still are still wary. Those are perhaps also companies that haven't quite got the same experience as others have. But I would really like to urge uh, urge the industry, and I assume that our in industry representatives also in this audience, to look into the options more seriously and, and make, make licensing and where necessary technology transfer a core part of a serious access uh, strategy. Over. Wow, uh, you have said. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you uh, uh, so much. Uh, thank you for the speakers of this webinar. Thank you for all the participants. Thank you also on behalf of Remco and the co-organizers, Coordate, KNCV, TBC and AIDS Fonds. Uh, at Klingenau, we hope to see you back at future events uh, in real life or online. I think it was really great that we have had you. I know that you're all not based in the Netherlands uh, and um, uh, also many of the participants are not. Uh, I think we had a very good and thorough discussion on this issue of access to uh to medicines and 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 health products and um this is really encouraging and also in light of the upcoming negotiations on the european policies the upcoming uh meeting on local production of the who here in the netherlands uh, and i hope also that they have listened into this webinar and and will make use of it uh, so thanks a lot again and uh, we hope to see you back in the future Thank you. Bye-bye to everybody. Thank you very much for your time and availability. Thank you.